Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Do I lift up my soul? Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Do I lift up my soul? O my God. O my God. I trust in thee. I trust in thee. Let us not be afraid. Let not my enemy triumph over me. And again, unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Do I lift up my soul? Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul? Do I lift up my soul? Oh my God. Oh my God.
and temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so fair? Jesus Christ, my King. 
what a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Amen. Everybody can have a seat. Happy Resurrection Sunday, Amen. Easter. Um, just wanted to share a couple things. When I was young, and even now, I have, I have a lot of questions. But when I was young, I had a lot of questions, but I didn't seek a lot of answers because I want to try to figure it out on my own. I don't want to bother anybody. I'm just a Lone Ranger. I want to figure it out. Um, so I'm kind of coming to you from this premise. Take you down memory lane a little bit. Um, there was a TV show that came on around this time. Uh, Burl Ives would say, here comes Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail. Hippity hoppity, yeah. Easter's <laughs> on its way. <laughs> Dying eggs and with my mother and um, biting into those yellow and pink peeps, those marshmallow things. Yes. Who likes those things? <laughs> God loves you. Uh, God loves you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Jelly beans, the white jelly bean, wow. No flavor, just sugar. And my mother's favorite jelly bean was the black one, black licorice. Anybody who loves the black rib, hey, God loves you. <laughs> okay, but as I um, started to get older and I started paying attention in church, Easter Sunday started to turn into Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to turn into turn your Bibles to Genesis 22. Amen. All right. Um, like I said, I still had a lot of questions, and I was getting some answers, but still a lot of fogginess, in it, especially concerning the Word of God. Genesis 22, start with verse two. And everybody knows this passage speaks of Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. How do you sacrifice your son, the son of promise? Yet the Lord has already told you through this son, many nations will be blessed and there will be many that come from this son. Mm -hmm. And then we go down to verse five. It says, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. I heard that and I said, wow, how is he going to take his son, sacrifice his son and come back with his son? Mm -hmm. Question. Go down to verse 7. Verse 7 says, But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Mm -hmm. Then he said, Look the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to a place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in, in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, nowhere in this passage do we see Isaac trying to get away from the binding. Nowhere do we see Isaac saying, I got to get out of here. My father's trying to kill me. 
please keep that in mind. I had questions, but I, I know y'all probably got it. Um, Isaac was willing to embrace the mission. Christ was willing to embrace the mission. The plan from the beginning was that God, the Son, willingly, willingly would take on humanity and his life would be a payment for Abraham, and Isaac, and you, and me, and all of the entire world. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hmm. Psalms. Turn to Psalm 41. Just a couple more passages. Mm -hmm. Psalm 41. We're going to look at 9 through 13. Beautiful picture of the Father's love for the Son. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be merciful to me and raise me up that I may repay them. By this I know that you are well pleased with me, because my enemy does not triumph over me. As for me, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face forever. Okay, you're going to stop there at verse 12. Um, let's go to the New Testament, and that's Romans 8, 11. So we see the Father's love for the Son. Now I'm getting ready to get personal, y'all, because this is the triune God's love for me. Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, from the dead dwell, from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells Amen. in you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Yes. And let's, one more passage. I just want to turn to one of my favorite passages. Like every time I read it, I get excited. And that's John chapter 17. Mm -hmm. Prayer Jesus made to his father. <laughs> Chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. I do not pray for these alone. He wasn't just praying for the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, as you, Father, are in me. Think about that. As we. Be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is all that the world may believe that you sent me. All of this is, again, a testimony to the world that God desires that none should perish but have everlasting yes, life. Yes, yes, Amen. Let's all stand and um, let's turn to Luke. Luke um, 16. I mean, Mark. I'm sorry. Mark 16. Mark 16. We're going to start at verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that might come and um, that they might come and anoint him. And very, very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone? from the door of the sepulcher. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were 
affrighted. Mm -hmm. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Mm -hmm. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they said, and they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, uh, mm -hmm. for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. All right, let's all pray for the message. Amen. Good morning, you may be seated. Uh, great word, Marshall. Very edifying. I love that. Um, I well, welcome you all to Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. Um, this might be, next to Christmas, one of the most popular days in the church to think about God. Um, people that don't normally think about God will think about God today. Um, the world has added some things to today to make it much more, um, less Christ-like. The way they take the Christ out of Christmas, they want to take the Christ out of Easter. So they introduce an animal, like a, a rabbit. And I introduce harmless things that they know children will love. Chocolate, candy, jelly beans. So introduce all of that. It's like they introduce the tree in Christmas to distract from Christ. But we know that the real reason why we're here is because of Jesus Christ. Amen. The real reason why we know is that today, historically, is the most important day in the history of the church. Yes. Um, the church, the spirit may have come down in Acts chapter 2. But the platform upon which we stand as believers began today. It began today. The resurrection. Christ, who was once dead, is now alive. Amen. He's not a Christ who was once alive and now dead, but he's a Christ who was once dead, thoroughly dead, mm -hmm. tested dead, mm -hmm. now alive. Amen. Christ is risen. Um, the entirety of our Christianity is based upon today. I cannot understand so much about Christianity, but I must understand today. What makes me a Christian is the resurrection of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 15 says that if no other, if Christ is not risen, then everything about our faith is fraudulent. Mm -hmm. We're the biggest frauds in history, actually. Um, First Corinthians 15, 14, without Christ rising from the dead, your sins are not forgiven. They're literally not forgiven, and our preaching is in vain. See, the resurrection is not just a factor in our salvation, it is a fact in history. It's historically correct. It's as historical as your birth. In fact, there are more witnesses to Christ's resurrection than to your birth. Think about that for a second. More people witnessed his resurrection than witnessed your birth. There was a story in the 60s about a guy who they couldn't prove he was born. No records. No birth certificate. They could, he, he had no identification. They could not discern his origin. Didn't know his parents. And ultimately, he was, he was buried in an unmarked grave. No one knew how this guy was born and where he came from. He just died. They couldn't track it down. But with Christ, at least 500 people saw a resurrected Jesus Christ. There's tremendous evidence for that. Um, and today is important. The most important thing about today is that Christ is risen. The most important person today is Jesus Christ. The hero of our church is Jesus Christ. The hero of your story is Jesus Christ. The, the, the plot in your life, the hero is Jesus Christ. That's it. Um, in the early 1920s in Russia, there was a huge Russian anti-God sentiment that eventually communism would come out of. But in this sentiment, in this season, they had a huge gathering of people that was an anti-God Crusade. Hundreds of people gathered and this guy came up and he started talking about the frailty of Christianity, that Christianity doesn't work, that you're weak and you're a fool. And there was a Greek Orthodox priest in the audience. He 
he stood up, and he asked to speak, and he simply said this as he faced the crowd. He said, Christ is risen. He said it again and again. And then the crowd began to turn. And hundreds of people began to say that Christ is risen. And he turned the entire meeting with those three words. Christ is risen. Whatever is happening in your life, Christ is risen. My sin is great, but Christ is risen. My enemies are serious, but Christ is risen. My health is not good, but Christ is risen. It is tremendously powerful in your life when you apply that to you personally. As Marshall said, when you personalize that, it has impact in your life. And in this portion of scripture, Mark chapter 16, we kind of began this a little bit four days, four messages ago. And we'll close with Mark as well. I like Mark's account of the gospel concerning the resurrection and this whole Passion Week because Mark is very specific. Um, so in the beginning of this chapter, you, you kind of read in verses 1 and 2, you read about three women that have come to the tomb to anoint the body of Christ. And they came because, number one, somebody had to. It was Jewish custom that the body would be anointed. And Christ really had nobody that would do that for him. They decided to do that. And they came because also they were expected to. Um, they came also because that's what the women did. Anointing a dead body was not a man's job in Judaism. In Judaism, the women did that. The women did that. So it, it was not only that the men were too scared to come, they weren't supposed to come. The body was anointed by women. That's why they came. They came because this was the way that you properly honor a dead person in Judaism. This is the right way. They came because they were mourning. They came because they were following this man for over three years, and they saw his life, and they saw the miracles, and they saw the power, and they heard the messages, and they walked with him all the way to the cross. If they did not follow him to the cross, why wouldn't they follow him to the tomb? They followed. We were following somebody for a long time. You just this is my guy, I'm behind him, and you follow, and you follow, and something happens. It's like it's happened to you. Like what happened to that person has happened to you. They followed him, and now it's over. It's over. One of his closest friends betrayed him on Friday night, handed him over to his enemies. He was put into a mock trial. He was beaten, he was executed. And then one of his secret followers, Joseph of Arimathea, shows up and offers him a tomb that was not his own. And he was put in the tomb. And the ladies are watching all those from a distance. And they see the tomb where he's buried. But then the Sabbath is the next day. That was yesterday. So they can't bury anybody on the Sabbath. They can't do any work on the Sabbath. So his body stayed there throughout the Sabbath. Stay there. Jesus is dead and Jesus is gone. No. And maybe all those who follow Christ are scared this is going to happen to them. See, I think sometimes we romanticize this story. We, we look at this story like they know what we know now. They didn't. As far as they knew, Christ, their hero, has been executed. And what would you normally do? You'd hide, wouldn't you? I'm not going out there. I'm not going there. So they, they were their, their hero is gone. Followers scattered. Everyone's worried something's going to happen to them the way it happened to Jesus Christ. He turned water to wine and they killed him. What would they do to me? Now, nine times in the Gospels, Jesus Christ said, I would die and raise in three days. If his disciples didn't pick that up, what makes you think these women would pick that up? Mm -hmm. No one expected him to rise from the dead. No one thought he would possibly return. No one, they all thought this was it. An extraordinary man who dies a very extraordinary death. But that's it. They weren't huddled saying he did say he would rise again. They didn't talk about that. Even the disciples were shunned and shocked. They were not expecting him to rise from the dead. Neither were these women. They didn't go to the tomb because they expected him to rise from the dead. They went to the tomb because they thought he was dead. Finish it. Tie the loose ends up. He was a good man. Have your memories. He's gone. 
It's gone. Think about it. All that happened on Friday. Here it is on Sunday. He's been in the sepulchre for almost three days. Now, they left early in the morning, these ladies, because they didn't want to be seen. Remember, they're fearful. Everyone who followed Jesus Christ is now being marked. So you want to move where you can't be seen. And they're heading to the tomb, and they've got all these spices and oils. And by the way, we're not talking about like a little small bottle of olive oil. We're talking about massive vials and veils. Their arms are full of spices. You're anointing an entire dead body. they got all this with them because we want to try to honor this man. This is the best thing we can do. This is our eulogy. Now, according to the Roman calendar, when Christ died, it was roughly spring. So it's kind of chilly, it's kind of springy, it's a little bit of breeze. But don't forget, the human body begins to stink between 24 and 48 hours. He's been in the tomb for almost a day and a half, running toward three days. So it's possible he's starting to smell. Because normally when you bury a body in Judaism, you anoint the body for burial before it stinks. You put the, so it doesn't stink. So they should have gotten in there Saturday, but because he died on Friday, they couldn't get it. The spice is in there on Saturday. So the extra day he should be stinking. And, that's, and the smell is the least of their worries. What about the stone? Normally in a, a, a mausoleum, what we would call it today. But a sepulcher is kind of like a cave. And the body was on a slab, undressed really, wrapped in like loose clothing that they just to transport it. Nothing special, nothing exotic really. And then they had like a stone, a, a rounded stone that they would just block the entrance for two reasons, thieves and animals. So you block it so they can't get in. But that was, that's a normal stone. The stone that was put on Christ's sepulcher was larger, and it was also sealed with guards. It's uncommon for a tomb to be sealed with guards. The Pharisees made sure they heard his word. It's so interesting that the disciples didn't get it, but the Pharisees heard him. And the Pharisees said, no, 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 no. Just in case. I don't know. You saw the guy turn the bread and fish. I'm not sure. Guards. Put the guards there. But now they get the scene. So these ladies get their arms full of spices, and they're walking, and they're thinking about how we're going to, they have no idea. By the way, according to the scriptures, they didn't even know about the guards. Because notice what they say. They don't say how we're going to get past the guards in verse 3. It's who's going to roll away the stone. So evidently, when they were following from a distance, they saw the stone and left. And later, the Pharisees came and brought the soldier, which was an added hindrance. How do we get past those guards? That wasn't in their thinking. So then when they got there, okay, they're coming. They're getting closer. Okay, they're getting closer. And they should be smelling because he should be smelling. Okay. But as they get there, and they're moving slow, they're not running, they get their arms full of stuff. And they're thinking about who's going to move this stone. None of the disciples are here with us. These are not young women. These are middle-aged women. And this stone was not small. And they're not as young as they used to be. So they got to figure out who's going to move this stone. Right? They it even asked the question in verse 3, who will roll the stone? Why? Because we're three old ladies. We're not going to move this stone. Plus we got our hands full of spices. How do we move this stone? As they're getting closer, as they're getting closer, what I like about it is their courage. All these problems are in their head, all this fear, and they keep coming. It's amazing. I just found three reasons right there why I just say, you know what, somebody else can get it. They stayed, they stayed after it. All right? Now, as the tomb gets in sight, all of a sudden, things start changing. From, seeing, from worried about a sealed tomb, now they get scared. Why are they scared? Because somebody has moved the stone. What does that say to you? By the way, when the stone is moved, they're not even thinking about resurrection. They're thinking about robbery. Somebody moved that stone. There's a thief in there. Who would move the stone? Who would break it? Evidently, the thief must have did this during the Sabbath. Who would rob a tomb on the Sabbath? Who would mess with his body? What right did a stranger have? They had fear, anxiety, and anger. It's kind of like, I don't know if you ever had your house robbed before. When you come in and you're looking around, I have. You walk in, the first thing you start doing is an inventory. What happened? 
it's like anger and fear at the same time. Are they still here? What just happened? You feel violated. And they're feeling like violent. Who would do that? And then as they get closer, they're coming closer now, their worst fears are realized. Not only did someone break into their teacher's tomb, we caught the guy red-handed. We caught the guy red-handed. He's right here. It's a young man in strange white robes. What kind of weirdo thief is this? <laughs> they didn't discern he's an angel. But just think about it. You're already in this state of fear and anxiety with your spices. The tomb is open. And there's a young man inside. Who is this thief? They're scared to death. And then the thief speaks. It's so funny. He says, it says, uh, uh, affrighted. They, they walked and you know what the word of fright it means? <laughs> Terrorized. Mm. Think about being face to face with a 150 pound pit bull. Mm. Terrorized. They saw this young man terrorized. And then what's so funny about God, God says, don't be terrorized. Every time I tell you not to do something, you immediately do it. Don't be afraid and you're instantly afraid. <laughs> don't be terrorized. And they're terrorized. What? Everything about this scene is wrong. The stone is moved, and you're here, and you're talking to us like you know us. I'm terrorized. I'm very terrorized. <laughs> very, very much. So everything you say is through the filter of terror. Okay? There was never a point in the conversation where the angels, it wasn't like in Luke chapter 2, or Luke 1, when Mary was spoke to the angel, and she kind of relaxed in the conversation a little bit. There's no relaxing here. This strict terror all the way through. Literally, she's like, they're both, the three ladies are like holding, they might even drop the spices, who knows? They're just like, what? Huh? And hey, don't be scared. Don't be scared. Look, have you seen you? Have you looked at you? Have you seen all of this? And this is what they say. This is what they say. He says in verse, in verse 8, he says, don't be afraid, right? Said, no, sorry, verse, um, verse 6. Be not terrorized. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Okay. But go your way and tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you in Galilee. You shall see that you shall see him. And he said, unto, as he said unto you. Wow. That's scary. Now, then it says in verse eight, I'm going to read this slowly. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre. They trembled, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Circle that verse in your Bible. There's a lot there for us. They didn't leave empowered to speak. They left trying to escape, trying to get as far away from this young man in this situation as possible. We can religiously romanticize it, that they came out with palms. And, no, there was none of that. Nothing that happened in that scene did they expect or believe would happen. The fact that Christ was not there was shocking to them. There was no aha moment. Oh, he did say he was going to ride. No, that was shocking. Where is his body? They may be even asking themselves the question, where is his body? What have you done? Where is, if he's not here, where is he? They were terrorized. I'll say it again. If the disciples didn't pay attention when he said he was going to rise from the dead, if the disciples did remember, how much more these ladies? Right. So we, you, we, again, you can't look at this portion like somebody like we know today. They, did, they weren't armed with this information. They were terrorized. Can you blame them? If you came face to face with God or an angel, would you not be terrorized? <laughs> isn't, that like, isn't it like that when we're Christians, we, we, we encounter God presence or something and it like frightens us? You may have been frightened by God. God moves in your life in a unique way. You're like, oh. How did that happen? Or you have a, this is another one that scares you. Answer prayer can scare you. That you actually ask God for something and then God did it. And you're like, I prayed for that. I prayed for that and it actually happened. Wow. It works. Oh, because you, you don't, no one goes into prayer like it works. You go into prayer like it doesn't work. But yeah, I don't pray about it. Okay, master. Yeah. And then once in a while, God did. <laughs> And you know you ask God for it. And God knows you ask God for it. And no one else knows. You're kind of like, I did ask for that a few weeks ago. And he did it. Who else knows? 
You get shot. They flew. Who doesn't want to run away from God when you meet God? They met the angel. And we all like the story of Mary says, be it unto me. We all, we all assume we'd have the same courage as Mary did at the birth. Yes, be it unto me. I'll, I'll, you'll figure out how I'm going to get pregnant. Yes, of course. Yes, it's easy. That's not realistic, really. This is realistic, really. I come face to face with a supernatural being in a situation that I don't expect, and I run like I run for the hills. And, and then what were the instructions? Get back with me on the instructions here. What were the instructions? Go your way. Tell the disciples and Peter who goes before you and together that there, there shall you see him as he said unto you. Those are the instructions in verse 7. What do they do in verse 8? Let's circle this part in our Bible. They said nothing to any man, for they were afraid. You know, God told them to talk and told them who to talk to. And they talked to no one. Has God ever asked you to talk to somebody before? And you just said, I'm not saying no. No, no, no. Where are you going? To a building. Who's in it? We'll be singing songs about Jesus. Is it a church? No, no, no. I don't want to talk about it. Have you ever shut your mouth when God wanted to open it? Yes. Well, you should say something and you don't. These ladies were scared so much. They got direct instruction from God and disobeyed. This is say they talked to one person. It would have been safe to talk to Peter, Correct. It would have been safe to talk to the disciples. They didn't talk to anybody. It says they left and said no word to no man because they were afraid. He just said, don't be afraid. Trust me. Look at you. I'm afraid. I'm very, very afraid. Look at you. You're in a place you're not supposed to be. I don't even know who you are. Who are you? They were afraid. You know what's in the middle of this a little bit with these ladies? As much as they honor God, failure. Many times in my life, one area that we all fail is when God says to speak, we don't. Many times in our life, we've been, we've been given directions from God and we don't obey. We can, just like these ladies, we can, we can, we can be scared. Not, not evil, not even malicious, but just know God. I'm not going to church today. No, God, I'm not going to pray today. No, God, I'm not, no. What? I'm scared. It says 366 times in the Bible, fear not. Do you know why God said this so much? Because we, we fear a lot. We're scared. Why do you think horror movies make so much money? We like to be scared and we're scared. The insurance business is a billion dollar business because people are scared. I'm scared. They had the greatest news possible. Jesus is risen. There is no greater message in this book and Jesus is risen. Even greater than Jesus loves me because I can't experience it without the relationship to the resurrection. They had the greatest news possible and they ran away. Even in Easter, sometimes Christians can be awful quiet. You don't even, they don't, they don't, they don't, you wouldn't know that Jesus is risen in their life. And what's interesting is these ladies, when they hear the news, they're not excited. They're not moved. They don't have all the joy. They have fear. You ever heard the Bible and you went like excited? Why is that person so happy about it? <laughs> even, even right now, Easter week for you could not be joyful, not even be happy, you know? Maybe your life is hectic. Maybe you're constantly busy. Maybe you're a little weary, a little tired, a little dis disconnected from people. I like to be alone. I got my own issues. Mm. Every time I take one step forward, it's like I take two steps backward. Mm. It kind of feels like failure. Mm. But when you say to me, Pastor, about the things of God, I'm not so hyped about that. Mm. I'm not as excited for God as you are. Mm. My life is a struggle, so I'm just hustling. I'm just trying to do the best I can. Mm. I'm not trying to succeed here. I'm just trying to survive. And it looks like that's my whole life, survival. That's my life. And on some level, you catch me on the right day, I could say my life feels like a failure a little bit. Yeah. You catch me on the right day, I got a lot of broken dreams and made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's me. That's my private resume. My public resume is Facebook and social media. That's what I want you to think about me. But my private resume is my life is a hot mess. Whole lot of issues, problems, fears. So when you say Jesus is risen to me, I'm not joyful. I'm indifferent. It's not hate. It's indifferent. I'm not moved. And when you look at this, this little tiny failure in this story, it's a little tiny failure. They were told to do A by God, and they didn't do it. That's what our life is like. It's a lot of little things that God will say to me to do. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Shake your fist at God. like, Or I'm not mean, but I'm not going to do it. Easter or no Easter. I'm not, Christ risen or not. See, the fact that Jesus Christ was risen did not motivate them to obey God. And the fact that Jesus Christ is risen today may not motivate you to obey God. Don't think I'm just going to dance in your life and say, Christ is risen, and tomorrow you're going to obey God. You may not. You may not. You may not. It's very possible. Don't ever think that just the, the, Jesus Christ is risen is enough to motivate a response to God. You may not. You may not. You say, Pastor, how is that possible? I just showed you. It's very possible. Three ladies that follow Christ for almost his entire public ministry, directly disobeyed a direct order from God. And it wasn't like they were asked to do anything. Just go tell those people. Your people. Mm. You can look at this little failure in this story in our lives. But I want to say this to you. When you run away, and you will, you still run to Jesus. Because one of the three ladies in verse 1, what's her name? Mary Magdalene. What did she do in verse 8? She ran away. Who did she find in verse 9? She found Jesus Christ. That he was the first person that Christ appeared to. So the person that had an assignment from God, who didn't work the assignment, still found God anyway. Now, when you run away from God in disobedience, God doesn't run away from you. He will get in your way. While you're running out of the way, God will find you in the way. Amen. Just like in Genesis chapter 28, when Jake was running from the promised land, he runs into Jesus Christ. He gives him seven promises, even though he's going the wrong way. Or like in 1 Kings 19, Elijah's running away from the promise of God, and he runs into angels and God along the way. You cannot run God. Amen. Cannot run God. Mary Magdalene runs right into him. Can you imagine fleeing from the tomb? Perhaps all three went three different directions because they were smart. Okay, you go this way, you go this way. We can't be together. That freak back there went to the church. I don't want to see him split it. So we all run in our different directions. And Mary went, she's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Where's where? Hey! Hey, Jesus. Where are you going? Wow. It's true. I was, gonna, I was gonna tell Peter about it. I was going. I was just going to do that. I'm so glad you came. We can go together. I was just gonna do that. Imagine, <laughs> right in the way. Remember when I was little, I used to always run from my mother, and I would run right into her. Hey, I was just going to clean. Her. I was just going to go do that. Yes. We'll have to play later. Oh, it's clean. Let's go be clean. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to imagine Mary Magdalene's face. She woke up on the first day of the week, sad. Okay, we gotta go dress his body. How are we gonna? I don't know. Just get the spices. Come on, you always complain. Mary, get the spices and let's go. So we're going there. Who moved the stone? Who was this week? I'm out of here. Hey, Jesus. That's her day. That's her Sunday. That's her Sunday. Right about this time, on Sunday, she meets Christ. Think about that. That's incredible. When our life looks like a tragedy, Christ rises in our, our situation, and Christ shows up in our way. He interrupts you. He gets in your way. He gets in Mary's way. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, and I like this portion for the resurrection, there's a lot of people running from Jesus. Turn back to Matthew 14. 
In that chapter, there are three men, or three runners, for three different reasons, all running from Jesus Christ. You have three ladies in Mark 16, and you have three men in Mark 14. And in Mark 14, you have the, the, the young man who runs away naked. They grabbed his towel. He kept running. That's what, that's what fear will do. I have a towel on. I'm naked underwoods. You grab my towel, and I keep running. I'm very scared. Some believe that that was Thomas. It could be, or the rich young ruler. But anyway, the young man running naked in, in verse 51. You got Judas running away because he's going to go plot to kill Jesus in, in verse 10. And you got Peter running away in 50 and 54. Three men, rich, naked young man, Judas and Peter. Three men running for three different reasons, all from Jesus. And the longest testimony in Mark 14 is actually Peter's run. Because he ran and then he followed. What's so funny about him? What's so interesting about Peter is that in the story, Christ says, you're going to leave me. Peter's like, no, 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 no. And he does. And he ends up, even when he runs from God, he ends up exactly where God said he would be. Have we done that before? Oh, wow. You run from God for a situation. I'm not doing it. And then you end up in some house, in some oh, scenario, the very thing you said, I will never go to church again. What those people did to me. And then you find yourself, I'm in a church. I'm in a church. How did I get back here? What is so wrong with me? Am I a glutton for punishment? Did I just come back here? You're exactly where God wants you to be. Mm -hmm. Peter is exactly right there. Earlier in the chapter, in Mark 14, at the end of the chapter, he ends up exactly where God said he would be. He's exactly where God has it. By the way, where God wants you to be is where he's got a chance to do something in your life. That's exactly what it was. See, the thing is this. God allows the failure for one major reason. Why does God allow failure and sin? One major reason. Because it helps us recognize our need for God. I need God. Your success will not help you recognize your need for God. Mm -hmm. Your failure. You get ground down to low. Like in Luke 15, the prodigal. When your plan is not working for you, when all your little schemes and your education and your career building and all your history and all that stuff comes to zero and it doesn't change the condition of your heart. <laughs> I can be a lawyer and depressed. I can be a doctor and discouraged. Don't assume that the, that the resume, your, your social media resume is going to change your heart. It's not. It's not. It's amazing. Now fast forward back to Mark 4, 16. I want you to connect this here. In Mark 16, who does Christ tell the ladies to tell specifically? Disciples and Peter. He specifically names Peter. Now, Peter has denied him. Peter ran from him in Mark 14, but in Mark 16, make sure you tell Peter. Peter might think he's no longer welcome. I don't want Peter here. He's a failure, but he's welcome. Make sure, even the young man, the young man says, the, uh, the young man says to the ladies, make sure you, they both say Peter. Peter. And by the way, watch this. He tells the disciples to go ahead, he, that he would go ahead of them to Galilee. This is where Christ began his ministry. Christ, at the end of his life, is inviting his guys back to the beginning. Are you with me? When you fail, when you fall, when you struggle, God is going to always bring you back to the beginning. Learn how to get there on your own. Learn when things go sideways, go back to the beginning. How did this relationship begin? I was weak. I was a sinner and Jesus Christ came and saved me. Before you get down to being a, a trustee and a deacon and you know, I'm the head of the, the prayer committee, get back to the fact that I'm born again. Luke chapter 10. Rejoice not that you have powers over devils and demons, but that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Celebrate that. That's the real truth of Christ is risen. I'm in the family of God. I'm saved. I'm born again. The devil, the wicked one touches me not. My life is not in my hands and not in his hands either. But in John 10, 28, it's in God's hands. It's in God's hands. Make sure you tell people. And I'm going, by the way, all the disciples who ran away from me, guess what? Let's go back to the beginning, guys. Let's take it back to the beginning. 
When you get so far away from God, the church is not on the menu, the Bible's not open, and prayer is something you do culturally for food. When you get that far out there, go back to your beginning. Begin again. Begin again. Christianity, your relationship with God is the one relationship that is new every morning in Lamentations 3.23. Begin again. Now, remember, he's inviting them back to go to the beginning. He's not reminding them of their failure now. He's reminding them of finding him before. Now, rewind back with me. Turn back to your Mark 14. I want to just read verse 50 really slowly. Are you sure, Jesus, you want these guys with you? What does he say? What does it say in verse 50 of Mark 14? And they all <laughs> forsook him. And what'd they do? They fled. What did the ladies do with the tomb? They fled. They fled. Fled, by the way, is not that power walking, in case you're wondering. That's a full on sprint. I am out of here. As you see the back of me, you don't see the side of me, you see the back of me. Fled. What's interesting is they fled in verse 50, but earlier in the chapter, he says in verses 27 and 28 of Mark 14, you will all fall away. Smite the shepherd and the sheep are scattered. And after I have risen, what does he say right there in verse 28? After I have risen, in verse Mark 14, what does he say in the next seven verses? I will go before you in Galilee. Go back to you now to your Mark 16. What does he say? What, is the, what does he say right there, Mark 16? He says the same thing. I will go, when I am risen, tell them to meet me in Galilee. He prophesied that he would meet them in Galilee before he died and after he died. That's amazing. That's amazing. He says the same thing in verse 7. I'll see you in Galilee. You know what he's saying? You're going to fail, but I'll catch you at the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. Because your failure is not an opportunity for me to say, I told you so. But it's an opportunity for me to show you just how faithful I am to you. How gracious I am to you. That how much I love you and how much I'm for you. And you in your weakness can still respond to me. See, faith is not about the accomplishments of men. Many denominations take your faith and make it your, your, your badge of courage. Your spiritual muscles. The more faith you have, the more spiritual you are. Faith is not about the opportunity of man's ability, but faith is about God. It's not about the accomplishments of man. And by the way, neither is Easter Sunday. We're not celebrating the accomplishments of men. We're not. But rather, faith is about my inability and faith in God's ability. And that's what Easter is about. Christ is risen. I had no way to raise him up. I had, no, I had nothing to do with it. But I trust in what God did. I put my trust in what God can do. It's not a story of our successes or our strengths or even a story of our ability, but really, because if you read the story, nobody gets it right. In Mark 14, who gets it right? In Mark 16, who gets it right? No, there's no one in the story that gets it right. But when all of us don't get it right, Jesus Christ is risen and he gets it right. He gets it right. The object of our faith was extremely faithful when he did it. He did what he said he would do. He did what I needed him to do. He did it whether I believe he did it or not. So I just want to close with this. There's a whole lot of hidden failure in our lives. There's a whole lot of times in our lives where we're just like these ladies. God has embraced us. He has come towards us. And we've said no. We've run the opposite way. And even when you run, you, I'm trying to get out of this city. I'm trying to get out of this church. I'm trying to get out of this family. I'm trying to escape. I'm trying to escape. I'm trying to escape. But nobody wins when they escape. But what are you escaping to? You know why? Because you take you with you. <laughs> the biggest impediment to your spiritual success is with you. Yeah. So there's no running. So running. It's really about him. Easter Sunday humbles me because Jesus Christ did the greatest thing that anyone could ever do for me without me, but he did it for me. Ed McCauley said this about Mark 16. The terrifying prospect of Easter is that God called these women to return to the same world that crucified Jesus with a very dangerous gift. 
hope in the power of God. It would make them look like fools. Who could believe such a thing that Christians at their best are fools who, who dare to believe in God's power to call dead things to life? Dare to believe today. Be, re be refreshed in the reality that God takes the dead things in my life and he brings them to life. Marshall quoted Romans 8, 11, this same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead can quicken your mortal body. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, in Christ he has. And in Galatians 5, 15 and 16, every day he will. Every day he will. Dare to believe God to call things that are dead to life. Romans chapter 4, he calls things that are not as though they are. My life looks dead and God just says, you know what? You're running the wrong way. Let me get in your way and remind you who I am. Remind you, because you have all your plans, right? How many of you have plans for tomorrow? Okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to go here. You have all these plans, but you haven't planned for God. Got all my bases covered. Bills somehow paid. Work? Eh. House cleaning? Eh. Today reminds me. Put Jesus back in the front of the room. Believe him to raise the dead things in your life. Your faith. Your marriage. Your kids. Your job. The things in your life that you feel have a deadness to them. Can he not also help raise those things? Sometimes we have dead areas of our life and we run away because we can't believe that God can bring life to that. I'm here to remind you today that because of Resurrection Sunday, Christ is risen. And if Christ be risen from the dead, what else can he raise in my life? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 3.20, he will do exceedingly and abundantly, far above what you could ever ask. And I love this part of the verse, I think. <coughs> God can do things I'm not even thinking about that can change my life, that can draw me to himself, that can move. This is the life of God. Christ is risen. And maybe tomorrow or Thursday or another day, maybe I'm like those ladies. God says, say something, and you're like, mm-mm, mm-mm. It's amazing. Muslims walk around with the loudest mouth in the world. Christians walk around in their families and their jobs and neighborhoods like this. You know what's amazing? We speak about what matters to us. The price of onions at Giant, used car sales, we put, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Christ is risen. Learn how to rehearse spiritual things in your life that are true. Rehearse that in your life. I'm not asking you to change your life. I'm asking you to rehearse the things that can change your life and let them change your life. This isn't a do Home Depot, fix your life up. You don't need that message. You just need Jesus Christ working in your life. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of all glory. Christ in your life makes a difference. Changing you, healing you, encouraging you helping you, guiding you. This is Christianity. Faith is not about my ability to change one bit. You cannot stop one sin in your life permanently. Yeah. That's not why you became a Christian, so you wouldn't sin. Jesus didn't die so you wouldn't sin. That's why he paid for sin. He died that you might know God. And in the relationship with God, he deals with sin. Not you. He deals with sin. This same spirit. Christ is risen. Amen. 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 Father, bless these words. This morning on Easter Sunday, thank you so much that you are risen. There's nothing that you cannot defeat. All power and all authority is given unto you and we are in you. You are the head and we are the body of Christ. Our enemies are our footstool as we're connected to you. We're in the hands of God. We are accepted in the beloved this morning. We are forgiven permanently by God. 
Christ is risen. Christ is risen. That's the greatest message I could say today. Christ is risen. Tell Peter, tell the disciples, tell the world, Christ is risen. It's a historical fact. His tomb, Buddha's temple, Buddha's grave is not empty. Confucius's grave is not empty. But the, but the, but the, the sepulchre of Jesus Christ is empty. And the stone is rolled away. Jesus is risen. If you've never made a decision for Christ, I'm not talking about being baptized, joining a denomination. I'm talking about you and your heart make a personal decision by faith to put your faith and your confidence in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That decision is possible because of today. So I want to encourage you to speak to God directly. The same way you speak to people, you speak to God. He's a person. Talk to God. And I promise you, if you talk to God more than you talk to people, you'll talk to people better. Talk to him today. You've never made a decision. And maybe you've made it before or you did it because you were pressurized or you did it because you were following some kind of culture. But you stand and fall before God alone. Choose for yourself. Speak to him. Invite him in. Invite him into your life. If that is your decision this morning, we want to help you. That's what churches are supposed to do. Help people to walk with God. If you make that decision for the first time today, you don't have to keep making it, but make sure you've made it. Don't assume anything. Make sure. Make sure of your salvation. Speak to me afterwards or raise your hand up high and put it right back down. That's what God is leaving you to choose today. Just so I can pray with you and for you. It's the one this morning. Or if you're listening to me at home, write in. Let us help you. We, we were not saved alone. We were put into a family to grow together. We don't grow individually. We grow together. For all of us this morning, this is a great refresher. I like to be reminded. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit brings back to remembrance the things that Christ has taught us. He's taught us about the resurrection. That is the greatest part of the New Testament message is the resurrection. That is, this, every sermon for the first 30 to 40 years of the, of the church was about the resurrection. It was about the resurrection and about the person of Christ. Every message. Can you imagine every Sunday, Resurrection Sunday? Not money, not um, prophecy, but specifically, but more about Messiah and the gospel. We should be well-versed in the gospel. We should be well-versed in the resurrection of Christ who was once alive and now is dead and now he's alive forever. Seated at the right hand of the Father, Hebrews 1.3. Father, help us now to think on these things, to be spirit taught, to be spirit taught through your word about the dynamic reality of our relationship with God because of the resurrection. Help us now, God, we pray in your son's name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah, Saint. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, I apologize. I, I, I was running behind today, and I didn't think I was going to make it because I've been out in Eldersburg for the weekend, and Uber don't really come out there like that. So I was sitting around waiting for a ride for longer than I'd like to admit. But I say I'd like to say God knew when I need to be here. And so I believe this hymn that I'm about to do is uh fitting for the tail end of this message that pastor just preached mm -hmm. um and if you know it this ain't a, a solo act i'm not doing this show for y'all if you know it please sing it along mm -hmm. Amen. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and is for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus.
and local needs button, select mission specific, and then select Owens Mills. And those online who would like to write to us, the address is Grace Family Fellowship, PO Box 1435, Owens Mills, Maryland 21117. So a small prayer for the offering. Uh, God, thank you for the message. Thank you for allowing us to be here. We yes, ask to bless this offering. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. All right. Amen. Would you all please stand? I must tell Jesus.
We'll close with this. The pastor mentioned it in the last part of his message. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Let's pray together. Father, you are able. And we rest in you. We rejoice in you this day. Because you have risen, all our lives are changed forever. We ask that you will reveal, Holy Spirit, this wonderful victory in all of our lives, in all the details and relationships, in all the craziness of our day. Help us, Lord, to see that you are risen at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.